Shut up and sit down. By all means, go for it. Have fun. Just leave me alone. People are coming together more and more and more and more as the government has been failing us more and more. I'm against being shitty to people. You can't research your way into understanding somebody. One way or another, I'd rather have the fight now. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Fight for Liberty show. Fight for Liberty Live, whatever you want to call it. I'm playing around with the name today. Uh, this show is brought to you, like all the other shows, by the wonderful guys over at Nug of Knowledge. If you are if you're watching me hit this all the time on the shows and you're wondering what I'm smoking, that's what it is. Delta 8 THC cartridges from Nug of Knowledge. Go on there and use promo code UNITE to get 10% off and help support me, FSM, and other awesome people in the Liberty Movement uh, over there at Nug of Knowledge. Today, we have a really fun guest that I'm excited to talk to. I went on his show with some friends a couple days ago. Today, we have the original fakertarian mr john hoot hey how you doing back how's it going pretty good what about you it's going pretty good so uh i guess my first question is uh how did you realize that you were not a real libertarian <laughs> okay so well it's an interesting story um i was a neocon for a while like years ago um like I was a big like George Bush guy and all that. It was some sad days. <laughs> I, I got to make a post about myself now. But um, so I saw Ron Paul in the 2008 debates and I kind of was like, this guy's a little weird, but I also was like, oh, he might have something there with that whole exchange with Giuliani. Um, and then after the 2008 election, I got kind of disillusioned with the Republican party and kind of did some soul searching um ron paul was probably a big part of that even though like even though i do have some issues with him i criticize i criticize him on like i still appreciate that mm -hmm. um and funny enough yep. like glenn beck was actually part of it <laughs> which is another funny one because he was like i i think it was because like he kind of turned on the patriot act and i was like wait if i'm i'm a republican but i don't just have to like follow everything republicans say and it made me kind of look at some different philosophies a bit, mm -hmm. but um, then by, it happened pretty quickly. I, it was Ron Paul and I read some Rothbard. Um, so I've been an ANCAP since like 2011 or so. Wow. Uh, I was libertarian since, I don't know, when did I start identifying as one? Maybe like late 2009, early 2010 kind of thing. But yeah, and I've been pissing people off since. Mm-hmm. Nice. I mean, it's it's the most fun thing to do in the Libertarian Party and it, just in the movement in general. <laughs> it's, it's pretty rewarding. Yeah, <laughs> I, would, I would say so. Yeah, it's it's always interesting when the person that brings you in isn't like great. And I feel like for the for a lot of people, that's the case. I mean, I was brought yeah. in by Gary Johnson, who I, mean, I love Gary, but there's plenty of criticisms to be <laughs> had there. And and I, a bunch of people that came in the last, this last election, like there's plenty of problems with Joe Jorgensen. So it's like, we, we keep like obsessing over finding the perfect messaging, but most of us came in under some pretty fucking imperfect messaging. No, I absolutely agree. And I also think it's kind of important not to get into hero worship with that kind of like when someone mm -hmm. brings you in, like Ron Paul brought me in, but I'm still, I still think there's areas where he was messed up. Like there was like the whole troops on the border thing during one of his presidential campaigns. I mean, mm -hmm. there were some problems with who he had uh, run his organization over the years, but like, I can appreciate him bringing me in. It doesn't yeah. have to be like an all or nothing kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause we're all like, no one is ever right about everything. It's just not, right. it's Except no me, one. Nubkin. <laughs> but I, I think that that's a big part of it too is like just realizing that you, that you fit into that and like you know when you join the party like none of us joined the party as like full-blown anarchists or very very few uh or you know we all were like barely reformed statists who just realized that like maybe our stances on drugs was wrong or immigration or something like right. that and it pulled us out of the party that we were in 
Yeah, I think I think and, drugs and are now we're the just first slowly things. learning things. Drugs was one of the first things to go for me, kind of to go from like the conservative angle to the libertarian thing. Because I was like, wait, small government or on drugs? Like these kind of don't jive together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really interesting. I I recall way before I knew what libertarianism was, or you know, I was still actually a full blown mm -hmm. neocon when it comes to like foreign policy here. Mm -hmm. But I remember I was like 13 and I was having a conversation with my mom about why prostitution should be legal because because <laughs> there should be a difference between immoral and illegal and just like still like a super conservative Christian neocon already was in that mindset of like, wait, but like we can just tell people not to do it and teach them why it's wrong. <laughs> we don't have to throw them in jail for it, right? Exactly. <laughs> Uh, it's not how it starts. Not very many people have that mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, this lag is starting to get to me. Yeah, it was a little for me too. Yeah. I have to like All not right. look at you sometimes. Just like <laughs> listen. <laughs> Technical difficulties are a forever part of this program. I've just come it's to accept good. that and we're just going to keep going. <laughs> um, but okay, so so you came in you came in a decade ago then. Uh, yeah. So I wasn't I wasn't a big L libertarian at that point because I was still like it was right before Ron Paul's 2012 campaign. So I was kind of hoping there'd be something with that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it got some momentum, but that kind of died out. And then I registered, I believe I registered for the LP in 2016 because I was I was thinking like, OK, man, maybe Rand Paul is going to be a continuation of his father. And that just didn't happen. I mean, he didn't even, he wasn't as good and he didn't gain anywhere near the traction. And then Trump, like, I don't think mm -hmm. I need to say anything else. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm done with this Republican yeah. stuff. Like I was already only a Republican to vote for like whatever the libertarian Republican candidate was. Like I wasn't going to vote for Jeb Bush or something or Ted Cruz or <laughs> something like that, but right. Yeah. yeah so I so I was going to say, so I've, I've been in the LP since like 2016. Gotcha. Yeah, I was watching, I was actually watching the Democratic primary a little bit more in 2016, even though I was a Republican. Uh, the Republican primary just looked like a shit show that I just didn't even want to like watch. I watched like one of the debates and watched a few interactions between like Trump and Ted Cruz. And I was just like, Okay, this is terrible. Uh, let's go see what the other team has. That's the team that that likes the drugs and and they're cool on on sex work and immigration. And so like, let's go see what that team looks like. And so like the second half of 2016, I was like watching that and like Clinton and Sanders and Chafee and actually Chafee. that was the first. I think like I, I I heard Chafee's like solid libertarian ish arguments from the Democratic stage before I heard Gary Johnson's libertarian arguments in that year. Uh, oh. And so that was kind of interesting um, to, to fe almost feel more at home in the Democratic Party there for like two seconds. And then then Chafee dropped out and it was just just like Sanders and Clinton. And I was like, OK, this is this is just a shit show. It's down to like the, these last four candidates. They all suck. I was complaining at the dinner table one night that like my first election was going to be like the worst one ever. And I don't want to vote for any of these people. And my dad was like, well, I, I heard about this Gary Johnson, dude. Uh, you should look him up. And I spent like three and a half hours watching Gary Johnson videos that night. I was just like, oh, my God this guy gets me. This is like guns and drugs. We're good. Like those are the only things I really care about. And neither party has both, but this guy does and we're good. Uh, and the, so now I actually, five I years voted, later, I'm an anarchist. <laughs> I voted for Gary in uh, 2012, <laughs> but I actually, I didn't even vote in 2016 hmm. because I was just, I was really pissed off at Bill Weld like a week before the election. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing this. I'm not not a well fan. I mean, I, I still like Gary. I have my like issues with him, but mm -hmm. like I could I could support a Gary ticket. I couldn't support a Weld ticket. Yeah, I didn't realize how terrible Bill Weld was until almost a year after the election. I was just like involved in local stuff and and in the party, and like people were complaining about him. I knew that he was a shitty candidate. I heard the comment about Clinton, 
that I was like, oh, well, that's sad. Why did you say that? But it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't a, that big of a deal to me watching that happen. It's like, oh, he's being like a, a sportsman competitor, right? Like he's just playing a clean race or something. I was like, that's fine. Uh, that's really all I thought it was. And then it's like, oh, no, he's actually like kind of a neocon and a Raytheon lobbyist and like all yeah, of these was... other things. And <laughs> the Hillary thing was like a final straw for me kind of thing. Because like I remember there was something about like not letting people on like the terror watch list buy guns or something. And the terror watch list like has like no due process on it at all. So it's basically mm -hmm. just the government picking who couldn't buy guns. And it, it just didn't. I remember like wanting something more out of him because it just didn't seem like he even really understood what libertarian philosophy was he kind of thought it was like just being moderate and it's mm -hmm. it's not yeah a lot of people confuse libertarianism with like radical centrism mm -hmm. and that's that's what i'd call bill weld he's like a radical yeah. centrist yeah he's like a he's like a socially liberal republican who doesn't really seem to actually have like an issue with government kind of thing. I think that's a good way to describe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a very big difference in mindset between like, government is inefficient, or government is evil, and co corruptive, yeah. and coercive, and fraudulent, and terrible. Like it's and you can, you can think of both, but there's like got to be like a little of each at the very least, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, there's a lot of people in the camp, which I think, you know, those are the people that we need to be reaching out to and marketing to are the Bill Welds of the world. Almost. I'm going to I'm going to regret saying that people are going <laughs> to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that on Fakertarians. <laughs> oh, please. <do. laughs> um, uh, you know, those those are like the the warm leads, but they're not the candidates, right? That's not the, right. the people that should be messaging for us. They're the people who are like almost there. They almost get it. And they're the ones we should be talking to. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I find that's another fun, like misnomer that we have in the party a lot is that like to say that this person should be able to be in the party somehow equals like they should be the state chair or a candidate or something like that also. No. And like yeah, be a messenger a for liberty. Mm hmm. Because you shouldn't have uh, to be like a, a perfect libertarian to be in the party. But I mean, if you, if you just kind of like just picked up a book about libertarianism the other day, like I don't want you like running for governor or something like that. Like right. if you're going to be on, on some like big stage, you actually kind of have to know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I equate uh, libertarianism to religion a lot and people don't like that. Uh, but, you know, you don't have to be a perfect person to go to church like that would defeat the purpose you know you need to get terrible horrible sinners to come to church and learn about why they're terrible horrible sinners but you're not putting them up on stage the next sun <laughs> sunday it's just not how it works yeah you uh, don't put them on msnbc to talk about hillary <laughs> yeah probably not the greatest idea uh so i guess my next question for you is uh, when did you realize that you could channel this philosophy that you had through fun things on the internet? <laughs> <laughs> so it actually started, um, so I started like maybe 2015, 2015, 2016 or so, I started writing a lot of articles um, on different libertarian topics. Like I've had some like published by antiwar.com and think liberty, which well, is one there, but, and then think liberty and some other sites. Um, and I wrote this one article, God, what was it called? It was like Trump libertarians rise of the anarcho status or something like that. And it was about how like there's, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. Don't worry. I'm not mm -hmm. just using this to like trash some people. <laughs> and it was about how like there's libertarians who like say they're anarchists, but then they're like, like, yeah, I, I hate government, but we got to keep the Mexicans out or something like that. Um, and it was, I specifically called out, uh, I think it was Chris Cantwell. It was before Charlottesville. Um, Stefan mm -hmm. Molyneux and then Justin Maldo, who was the uh, creator of Liberty Hangout. I'm not sure how mm -hmm. familiar you are with him, but had a, a lot of runs. Yeah. So I posted that article and it, it honestly, like, like, 
okay, I was going after the guys, but it wasn't like, I wasn't just like calling them names. It was like a, a, like an actual like academic argument. Mm-hmm. And then I remember someone from Liberty Hangout just kind of like popped onto my comment section and just wrote this like a weird thing about how like I'm a loser and they will always win or something. This guy later used to, later on, this guy who wrote that comment uh, became a pr- producer for David Duke and Richard Spencer, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> but, um, and so I kind of like played around with Liberty Hangout for a bit and I would kind of taunt them. They, they turned into like a full on Trump thing now. Like I don't even, I don't even know what the hell's going on there, but they were always kind of leaning that way. Mm-hmm. But that's when I got a few months after that is when I got involved with starting Fakertarians with some other people. And it's actually kind of interesting who started it. It's like, it's like a really weird uh, mix of people. There was a mm-hmm. Matt, I always butcher his last name. It looks like Kunal, but I think it's pronounced Kino. He was the guy who ran for chair of the Libertarian Party in 2018 as mm-hmm. a as a Libertarian Socialist, and now he's like a Stalinist. <laughs> <laughs> but and we don't talk anymore, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and then it was also Josh Smith who was one of the founders of Fakertarians, which is just looking at that now is kind of funny. Mm-hmm. But I think it was it was really through that. Um, that I learned about having fun on the internet through it. Cause it was like, we started making memes, like making fun of Liberty hangout and like their anti-Liberty positions. And that's, that's basically how Fakertarians grew. It just, it got out of hand and turned into what it is now. <laughs> nice. I, I loved you guys when, when that was a thing, like when it first was just you guys make shitting on Liberty hangouts was when I, first came across the page before I was even like involved in the LP or like nationally I stayed I stayed really local for a long time I cared about local candidates I worked Mm -hmm. on Larry Sharp's campaign in 2018 Uh, I didn't get into the LP drama and the politics and the bullshit really until like last year I I knew lucky yeah a lot of people and so I knew like personal backstories and baggage and like why people hated like Nick Sarwark and stuff. Like I knew, I knew a decent chunk of it. I, I followed some of like the LNC drama, but the actual like full on party stuff and like this, like when you guys split and, and everything happened, I had no idea. I was just like, Oh, there's this page that I follow. I don't know anyone on it. I don't know anything that's going on behind the scenes. I had no idea what was happening. And so catching up on all of that drama has been very, enlightening and educational over the last few months <laughs> no i bet there's a lot that happened and i've been i feel like i've been in like a bunch of different corners too because i was involved mm-hmm. with the mises caucus for like i don't know two years maybe three mm-hmm. i can't do math right now because i'm tired but um yeah so i've i've been in a lot of like different parts of the party i would mm-hmm. say you're not the only one which i find very interesting how many times people switch team jerseys in the inter-party drama. Yeah, like I was a really big uh, Josh Smith for LNC chair guy in 2018. Like I had like the, prof- I still have like the profile frame if you go back and look through my pictures and uh, I was like, I, yeah, I was like working behind the scenes with him and everything and I don't know, I just got, I, I, won't, mm-hmm. I won't bore you with too much but I just got disillusioned with it eventually. Don't want to get you in too much trouble. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm already in enough trouble with him. Uh, <laughs> there, yeah, but it it's, it is interesting because like I used to be like really really anti Mises. Uh, I find it really funny having conversations with Archie Flowers now because when I met him, I didn't like him. Uh, we were we were moderators together in a Facebook group. And he just he just rubbed me the wrong way. I don't like just because online inter- interactions just aren't the way that in person yeah. ones are. No, Luckily, I've, I've gotten to talk to him like through Zoom and stuff like that. And you know, on your show and had a couple of like actual human conversations with him now. But like we met like three years ago when he was hardcore Mises and I was uh, Brianna Coyle introduced us. And so I was like. I'm her best, or I was her, like, she was my best friend for quite a while, and I was pretty anti-Mises, and him and I argued on the daily about, 
like, oh, Mises is terrible. And, and I'm and he's sitting there defending him. And now we're on Twitter reconnecting a couple months ago. And he's the exact we're, we just flip flopped. It's him calling me a, a Nazi for supporting say, this wanna, Mises caucus. I'm like, I want to pull up some of those old screenshots. It's kind of funny to look at. <laughs> right. Uh, that that Facebook group was a shit show. It was called uh, Make Politics Sophisticated Again. And it was not sophisticated sophisticated <laughs> no, i believe that we we tried we tried really hard but facebook groups are difficult yeah yeah i, I run one you so. should know about that <laughs> uh, mine's like intentionally sure. difficult a little bit because we just kind of like let it get out of hand on purpose and just have <laughs> fun in there but no i definitely know about that mm -hmm. well I, I was actually a i was a mises caucus moderator too so it's like two different things it's like a really like tightly run group and then there's like dumpster fire mm. <laughs> It is it is amazing the dichotomy there. Uh, so what what caused you to go from just a page to like a group? Honestly, like it's not even a great story, but I was I was just bored one day and I was like, you know what? I'm I'm just going to make this group and just see what happens. And I would say like the original year or so was probably the most fun part because mm -hmm. we had a lot of people in there who like really did not like us. I mean, we still have that today, but it was like, like, it wasn't just like Mises Caucus people or something like that. It was like the real like hardcore alt writers who would be coming in, like saying that like the Jews declared war on Germany or something like that. And we would just like clown on them like crazy. It was, it was a really fun time, but <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. The. I love how I was having this conversation earlier today with a friend of mine who's uh, actually in the process of converting to Judaism. And uh, they informed me today that that was like kind of hush hush, which I didn't even know. <laughs> and because because she's like, I don't want to like tell people that right now. There's a lot of people that are going to not like me for that. And it's it's really sad how many people are just outing themselves on the Internet right now. It's like, oh, absolutely. You know we can all read this, right? And it's and it's there for forever. And Wayback Machine exists now, and you're just kind of fucked. Like, if 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 you're wrong, like you know, you're just wrong. <laughs> it's not a great look. Yeah, and I'm gonna end up screenshotting it. Right. So how do you like? how do you go through and actually do the like back, like the research and stuff that you do? That's always kind of amazed me that you guys have the kind of evidence and like screenshots and stuff that you have. Like, where do you find the time to actually go and dig for so, that? So it's not usually just like a, like, okay, I'm going to log on right now. Like maybe there's been times like that where I've been like, I'll, like for like a podcast or something like when we did that podcast on Lou Rockwell, like I did a lot of digging specifically mm -hmm. for that podcast, looking through all, all articles and all that. But a lot of the times it's just kind of like immersing yourself into the environment, you could say, like the Facebook groups and just kind of like it's it's really like organic, just kind of seeing what goes on. And then we have like a, a mod chat where we send stuff back and forth. Like if something weird is popping up, one of us will send a screenshot or message and we'll we'll figure something out, but it's, it's not even like our postings, not even really, what's the word for it? Organized. <laughs> it's just like, whoever feels like it, we don't like schedule posts or anything like that. It's just like, you mm -hmm. know what? I feel like posting about this today. Hey, that's how I run my social media. <laughs> I, I just know people have like, like you got to post like exactly at this time of the day and it has to be like spaced out. But me, I'm like, I'll post something at like 630 in the morning and then I'll post something again at like 645 just because I feel <laughs> like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Caitlin Cloven has lectured me a decent amount on that kind of stuff. Oh, wow. <laughs> that, was, yeah, that was crazy. <laughs> Pops right in. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm right there with you. It's like the, the scheduling it out is not, is not my forte. No, because it's like I find something cool. And I'm like, you know what? I want to throw this up there now. I'm impatient. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's how, like, to me, that's how social media works. Like, from a, from a very, uh, like, layman's kind of 
opinion is like when there's a thing you have to be part of that thing is that's what's going around and that's what's popular right now so you know you need to like use the buzzwords talk about the whatever tweet people aren't happy with today and it's it's honestly fucking exhausting like oh yeah no it, it really is sometimes there's times i just have to like chill for a bit because especially like because mm -hmm. we get into a lot of arguments and there's a thing with fakertarians that when someone sees fakertarians comment it's like automatically tied back to me and everyone thinks it's me saying it i mean a lot of it is but like i feel it so i feel like i have to be like personally responsible for every single argument we're in and it it does get exhausting after a while so sometimes i'll just be like okay i want to tone it down for a little bit here mm -hmm. yeah i had a great weekend because i just put my phone down and went into like a weird ADHD hyper focus thing and was working on a couple of graphic stuff and just kind of had my phone sitting there and wasn't really on it. It was beautiful. I had no idea what was going on. I got on Twitter at night and everyone was mad about something. And I was like, I don't know what's going on. I'm just going to log back off. Yeah. So when I, when I do that, like I'll like go to the beach for the day with my girlfriend or something. And then I get home at the end of the day and the, the list of notifications I have, is just like, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm never going to catch up with this. I just have to like, I have to like read through the Fakertarians mod chat to kind of catch up to see where we're at. Mm. Yeah. I, I kind of envy that you can like walk away and, uh, uh, you know, have other people be kind of keeping the page going but at the same time that would be i would i would just be yeah sitting there reading through the notifications like figuring out what other people are saying on the account and it would probably end up being worse and i would spend more time like reading what other people are posting than i do currently posting things myself the best part <laughs> is when like someone else gets me into a fight mm -hmm. <laughs> like on twitter or something and Everyone, everyone thinks it's me, so I have to like go respond later. But I'm like, okay, what, what am I? Who's mad at me now? It is fun how the internet can make people mad at you without you doing anything. <laughs> would be would be nice if we actually just like took people at face value. You know, had had human conversations with. That would be good. I can't them, disagree. And then that. tried to figure out where they were coming. You know, like adults. And I know we're accused of <laughs> acting in bad faith and stuff all the time. I don't think we do. I know we've we've definitely made mistakes before. We've made posts that I've even like retracted posts before. Like or I've I've made a post and then like been like shit, I'm I'm wrong about this. And then I've wrote like edit at the top and like and fixed it. But so mm. we mess up too. But I do yeah. think like I, there have been times that I could like really take someone out of contest context like obnoxiously and like make them like look terrible for anyone who doesn't look at the context and mm -hmm. i uh, people might disagree with me but i honestly don't do that that's good i just gotta throw this one up here because same <laughs> 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 it pretty much is yeah <laughs> uh yeah the the taking people out of context thing is difficult because almost everything is out of context when you when it comes to screenshots yeah. and stuff uh you know even a lot of the drama that happened this weekend the people that were in the conversation afterwards that only saw screenshots didn't understand how it was kind of the other situation the, the screenshots pulling it out of context made it look not as bad because without yeah. without what was going on and who it was aimed at and what was what the conversation was you know, a bunch of people were like, oh, it was just joking with a friend. And it's like, yeah, actually with the, the duck guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause a lot of, I don't, I don't understand the, the logic of like, oh, if there's a reply to a reply, it, there's no possible way that it was actually meant for the, the tweet. Yeah. It's just above it. No, I've, no I've heard that. Way. And it, you can just piggyback off of it. Like you don't have to, cause if you want to keep the conversation going, like, it could be to the person above. It could be to the person above that. Like, right. There's no rules about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, so yeah, the, the context thing is, is quite difficult. 
constantly because you'll even just like see tweets get that like you know something eight nine tweets down in a thread got retweeted so that's all that you see when you're scrolling is that tweet and it's like oh this guy looks like he's being an asshole here but if you click on it he's responding to someone who's already being an asshole and yeah. it was completely fine so it's it's really weird how like Twitter is basically set up intentionally to just fuck us over in that area. <laughs> and the fact that you can't explain yourself, like you're limited to it, at least it's longer than it used to be, but you're limited to a certain amount of characters. Mm -hmm. Like it, you have to kind of cut down on the nuance. You can't explain things as well. So it, it definitely inflames things to say the least. So how do you, uh, how do you work to, tr to try to avoid that? I mean, it's tough because I've even been like criticized for taking like minute long video clips out of context for something like that comes up like a few minutes later. So it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of difficult, <laughs> but I mean, I, tr I actually do try to like explain context on things sometimes. I know people don't like exactly how I do it sometimes. Like, okay. But like when I post a screenshot or something, I like kind of setting the scene for it and like saying like, okay, this is what was happening. Like this was a conversation about this or mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. That makes sense. But I mean, it's, if you look at our, our timeline, it's not like we don't get into flame wars all the time. So I'm probably not the best person to ask about that. <laughs> <laughs> that is fair. Uh, yeah. Like I said, Twitter, Twitter, I feel like is made kind of intentionally for this and there's a lot of other things that you know twitter is definitely specifically made to like piss people off like there yeah. isn't no absolutely like the algorithm just works like that it's 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 how the whole system is set up it's been fun to, tr to actually use it like positively though the last few months i've always seen twitter as a dumpster fire i never went on it I had an account literally to run for class president when I was in college is why I made at David fight. Um, so I still have a bunch of followers from like high school <laughs> and that's fun. Uh, but I just, I hated it. And I just started using it again when I ran for office in 2019. And even that was sparingly because I just always saw it as a dumpster fire cesspool that had no like redeeming qualities at all. But this year so far, you know, I've made I've met most of the friends that I've made this year on Twitter. I have gotten in touch with a bunch of like really cool people that I wouldn't have ever been able to talk to. You know, even just on the show, I've had, you know, Scott Horton and Dave Smith and Mark Pellegrino from Supernatural and like just a bunch of people that I've been watching on TV or YouTube for years. Uh, it, and then you know, recruiting people into the party, getting them signed up for their state party. And you know, it's just actually been kind of useful. And it's tough to try to balance the the little bit of usefulness that I am getting out of Twitter with the fact that it is still a cesspool dumpster fire that I should be avoiding when I can. <laughs> no, yeah, it can definitely be used for good. But like I was saying, the the character limit makes it a lot harder. It's like you're online, so that makes it hard. And then the character limit, you can't explain yourself as much, and that makes it even harder. So it's like it's like Facebook on steroids. Yeah, yeah, that's accurate. Uh, but it also helps you like meet new people better than Facebook does, because uh, Facebook's kind of meant for echo chamber messaging, and at, at least Twitter kind of helps us break out of that sometimes. But you can still cultivate a pretty good echo chamber on Twitter if you follow just the people that agree with you and mute everyone else. <laughs> I was going to say, just like <laughs> block everybody. Yo, I had, I had fake Rotarians muted for a decent chunk of time. I believe it. I'm sure a lot of people do. But, like I'll just, I'll find people like that. I don't even, I have no idea who they even are and they have us blocked. I was just like, Oh, like that. That's like a regular occurrence. <laughs> I had that the other day. Somebody, somebody like sent a screen or a, sent a post to a group chat and it didn't come through. I'm like, what did I do to you? Why am I blocked? I'm, I'm a nice guy. Come on, man. I mean, half the time with me when I see something like that, it's just, it's Peter Quiznos, but that's a whole nother story. I have him muted now too. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah. Somebody sent me a screenshot of hit from him today and was like, oh, did you see this? And I was like, nope, he's muted. 
Fuck that guy. <laughs> like, I'll see that, like, he's on a tweet thread with me. So I'm like, oh, damn it. I have to, like, log off. and Because he has me blocked on my personal, too. Mm. So I have to, like, log completely out of Twitter. and like Or, like, go on, like, the browser on my phone and, and check it from there. Just to, like, to see what people are responding to when, when I'm in it. Mm-hmm. I, I check those. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> I I uh I have one it's not even like a sock account it's just a an account that is completely unrelated to politics for the most part so th- no one knows that I control that one so no one will block that one if they block me and I'll go I'll really only go look through it if there if I see like a bunch of comments that I can't see <laughs> not a bad idea honestly maybe I should do that <laughs> Uh, yeah, because I just uh, I normally don't care, but if it's comments, if it's like directly responses to me, yeah, I'm like, all right, I want to know what you're saying, um, or like quote tweets. Sometimes I'll go try yeah. to find. Yeah, it's happened to me too. Mm-hmm. But luckily, not too many people dislike me yet. That the, yes. that's the one good part about the whole. I wasn't part of the drama for a while. Is that we, not I, much we of it surrounding? We gotta get me you yet. on our podcast no. again. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I didn't lose enough friends. Yo, I lost like a hundred followers this week so far on Twitter. Seriously? <laughs> yep. Is that I, like? Do you have like a not a lot of variation like that, or is or is this like never. something new? I I didn't even when like the great purge happened back in like February or, or in January, and then even like the second one that happened in like mid February where it was more like big L libertarians. I lost like five to 10 followers throughout that. Um, I was having pretty good days, the two days that those purges happened. So I was kind of like making back followers as I was losing them, Yeah. but, but like no noticeable variation. Um, and then yeah, this last week it, it just, psh. I mean, our bad, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Who knows if it's related? So. It's all right. <laughs> Try to get you some more. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it, it, it was when I started going after. It was, yeah, it was, it was like, it started dropping off the second I started going after Pete. Yeah. Uh, it was very much that. I got quote tweeted a couple times and a bunch of people started unfollowing me. And I was like, all right, that's I fine. I saw that. Yeah. yeah I'm, honestly, like, to clear up misconceptions, like, I don't hate everyone in the LPMC and I do think there are good people there. And like, there's people that I'd be happy to work, to work with there, but Pete is definitely not one of them. Just going to throw that out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I have to agree with that uh, assessment for a while. He was kind of in my like, Oh, he's an asshole, but, but we, we can still work together zone. That's where it's where most people in the LPR actually, uh regardless of caucus yeah um it's where it's where andy craig sits in my book too but you know that's okay we we used to not get along but we actually hey. do now uh but yeah i'm glad that him and i finally got to meet also uh pennsylvania was great to finally just get to to take away the all the online personas and just see what you're like in person uh, we need more of that no, I definitely get that. Mm-hmm. I actually, on Pete, though, it's funny because I actually, like, used to like his stuff. Like, I actually, when I was uh, in the Mises Caucus and, like, all the podcasters joined at once, it was, like, Tom and Dave and Pete. And I think, who else was it? Like, Jason Stapleton or something? Mm. Uh, Pete was actually, like, my favorite out of those. But Interesting. Yeah, at the time. But <laughs> we've, had both- some, we've had some issues since. Yeah, that was, I'm assuming, before he became a little bit more unhinged. So he always had, like, a little bit of the, like, okay, this guy's kind of edgy thing to him. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't talking about how, like, he'd rather side with tankies than blue-pilled libertarians or something. Or he wasn't talking about sending single moms to get Mo. So. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a fine line between edgy and asshole, and yeah, he's like a mile past that line, I think. <laughs> and it's it's funny because I'm not even like someone who's against like 
off offensive jokes or dark humor or anything like that. Like I actually like a lot of that. Mm. Like I grew up, I grew up on South Park. Like that doesn't bother me. Everyone yep. thinks I'm gonna be like some like uptight, like you can't joke about anything, but like honestly, like just don't be a dick about it. Right. I had probably my favorite dark humor interaction as of late was with um, Sam Robb from from PA, who's a who's a yeah. pastor and a and a vice chair of the state party and like one of the most stand up people in the party that I know. And I was talking to my friend uh, Tom Queter, who who is disabled and in a wheelchair and he doesn't really have legs and Sam walks up to him and goes, Hey, nice to meet you. I thought you'd be taller. <laughs> yeah. Like that's fine. It's just like, just like, it's just playing around. It's not like, <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's not like a yeah. hanging a trans person thing or something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's, there isn't a, th a fine line between those two. It's a very big, like very objective, noticeable line. It's like, hey, yeah. one is with a friend who's cool with it. The other is with a stranger online who you don't know. And if it's, there's a difference between like using it, like to laugh with everyone and using it as an actual attack. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't understand trying to conflate the two. That, that logic doesn't make sense to me. I'm with you there. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm all for I'm all for dark humor. Like I really like it. If, if anybody if anybody wants to see the worst of me, go to Reed Coverdale's show. Look for episode eighty. It's called "The Fight for Truth," and it's awful. It's like objectively two hours of just awful. Um, like there's a point in it where Reed makes a, a logical argument that Christians should be okay with abortion um, and also should be happy when a school bus crashes and all the kids die. <laughs> Um, we were talking about how cool the Nazi uniforms look and how badass their flag was. It's a bad, it's a bad yeah. episode, but that's me. I, I have no problems with that. There's just a time and place for it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And we get branded. I don't want to say we, um, I don't want to <laughs> co collectivize us too much there. Uh, but it's, we get branded as like, you know, snowflakes or whatever, or blue pill. You've said that term S a couple times. S J W beta S cuck soy blue pill something. Leftist. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, and that just for calling out, you know, the very clearly crossing of the line. It's like, oh, you just don't like dark humor. It's like, but no, we do. We really, really do. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, it's like I said, just don't be a dick about it. They're not mutually exclusive. Yeah. It, it's it shouldn't be that difficult of a challenge um <laughs> these comments are cracking me up um what we have but, coming in oh yeah i'm looking at yeah. you now <laughs> who's we <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah so back to back to online activism and okay. and using using liberty for or using the interwebs for liberty uh, how do you think that we can kind of continue doing that and uh, get a little bit better at it and a little bit cleaner at it and do what you're doing and also do what, you know, some of the, like the, the more out of party messaging people are doing without kind of like crossing wires and having the inf fighting be all we are. That was a I mean, if I, I feel like if I knew the answer to that, like, I'd be making a lot of money right now, <laughs> but um, hmm. you make a good point. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. You honestly have me a little stumped there. <laughs> what do you think about that one? I don't know. Uh, I I like the idea of well, first of all, I think a lot of calling out that can be done in person or not in person, but like personally and privately should be. I know that most of what you do is, is when like it's past that line and, and those, those kinds of things aren't working. Uh, but there's a lot of people who will like call out their friends, like their good friends on Twitter and like quote tweet people that they could just have DM'd. Yeah. So I think, I think stopping that is probably step one to making infighting no longer our persona. Uh, but when it does come to 
like the stuff that you're doing where you know obviously those personal like hey dude that wasn't cool uh comments aren't working yeah, anymore. Yeah, there's people I've tried that with. I don't <laughs> Yeah, I've I've tried it a few times. It doesn't go over well. Um but neither does calling them out online. Like I my biggest pet peeve with the LP right now. Actually, yeah, I guess my biggest answer to my own question here is <laughs> to stop quote tweeting the shit. Like if if you see a tweet that you dislike, quote tweeting it only amplifies it. Yeah. Uh, screenshotting it and then sharing it to a different social media platform is now like tripling the reach, you know, and especially some of these accounts that are doing this stuff have good followings and have like followings that don't need to see this shit. You know, they're, if you're out there trying to message to, to normies and you're, then you go and pick up a bunch of followers that are normies who you're actively messaging Liberty to. And then they log in a couple weeks later and all they're seeing from your timeline is just like quote, treating a bunch of Getmo posts. It's like, that's, that's not, we're not doing anything beneficial here. We're only no, making like, that. Even, yeah. Even as someone who like has probably quote tweeted a lot of people and obviously has shared a lot of screenshots, I would even agree with you there. Like that can't be like, People are going dis to disagree with me here too. And I think it's important to call out harmful elements and obviously harmful elements in the Liberty movement is very subjective. I might think something's harmful. You might not think it's harmful, whatever, but that can't be like what everyone focuses on. I mean, I know like we focus on that, but that's like the purpose of our page. You can't just be like, it shouldn't just be every Liberty page doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's an important part of it too is you know, we, yeah, you, you just, just deflect or, uh, you know, give that, give that responsibility to you. It's more, it's easier that way. Uh, cause when it's all of us, when it's an entire wing of the party or something like that, like, like even right now, a majority of the people in the LP who would consider themselves left libertarians are in, are in this group of, I'll call them the loser brigade. And, and so it's, we're crippling like all of our messaging to the left because all of those people are like what I just said, they're going out there and they're finding people, warm leads on the left and they're trying to bring people into the movement and into the party. And then they're just seeing that shit storm when they actually start following us and just our entire messaging to the left has been crippled for months now because all yeah. our leftists are raging against internal drama instead of recruiting. <laughs> yeah, no, I couldn't have put that better myself, honestly. Like ever I feel like everyone's pissed off right now though. Like the right's <laughs> pissed off, the left's pissed off, the prags are pissed off, the radicals are pissed off. Everyone's just kind of pissed. But yeah. That's, that's the libertarian party, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I <laughs> So the whole liberty unity thing that that we've been doing for six months now, uh, a little bit over that now, it I'll admit it was kind of naive in the beginning because, like I said, I I wasn't a part of all of this drama, right? I thought that the infighting was what people were saying it was out, out in the open and like an ideological battle, and to have an ideal logical battle like that from within the LP is in my mind kind of stupid. Like a lot of the ideological things that, that we argue about, I'm like, all right, that doesn't matter until we get rid of the state. Like then we can talk about whether or not, uh, you know, people should be sharing or trading more often than the other one. Like right. <laughs> if that's, if that's what you really care about, let's argue after <laughs> we defeat the state. So it right. was just kind of like, uh, you know, why don't we all just get along? Like, this is kind of stupid. Like, let's all go. And then the more we were doing it and it was working for a while, you know, a lot of the new people who didn't have baggage, who didn't have drama, loved the idea of Liberty Unity. And, you know, I we brought a bunch of people into the party and into the movement because they were seeing this drive for unity. And they were like, that's cool. I want to be a part of that. You know, a lot of them like came from Unity 2020 or something like that. And they you know, saw they were disillusioned with the duopoly, didn't really know what was going on and saw another group of people that had similar messaging and were like, all right, yeah, let's go do that. 
thing. And then we turned them all into libertarians. And it's been it's been really fun. But then there's still the people like yourself who, you know, I'm never going to ever be able to convince you to just like drop all the drama and just get along with everybody. <laughs> Come on, man. Like there's, and there's some like personal a, there's shit a history there, there you that, know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's very mm -hmm. like complicated. It's not just mm -hmm. like everyone's gonna sing kumbaya tomorrow. I mean, I, I do like the idea of liberty unity and like people working together, mm -hmm. but there there are issues too. And I'll I'll admit, like at first I I've I've warmed up to it a lot more than I used to. Like when I first saw it, I honestly like I didn't I didn't know you, I didn't know anyone else involved with it personally. And I just saw it as kind of like a cover for, I, I won't get you in trouble, a cover for like certain people's political ambitions or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I can tell like a lot of it is actually in good faith. It's just, like you said, it's it's complicated because there's, there's going to be a line for people about who they're willing to ally with, whether it's based on someone's positions, whether it's based on personal drama between them. Like it's, it's just not so cut and dry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And part of part of the misconception of the whole thing, and Reed has kind of touched on this a little bit more lately, uh, is that it was never supposed to be like a destination. There was there wasn't like a time where we were gonna achieve liberty unity. <laughs> like that's that's not a thing. It's it's an idea and a mindset of like let's continuously be trying to work for unity. Like like whenever a Libsock and a Mecock person runs a campaign together, that's Liberty Unity. You know, it's more of like the idea of it. But, and it also wasn't ever supposed to be like a group. It's not like you were supposed to be joining Liberty Unity. Yeah. It was just like a, a mission from within the party of, of just, you know, everyone in the party sh should be in the party instead of into these like fractionalized groups and arguing with each other. So for me, it's not about like being allies. It's more about just not being enemies anymore. But I know even that is a bigger ask than a lot of us realized it was in the beginning. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's been it's been an interesting couple of months learning everyone's baggage and why they don't want to be friends with each other. Yeah, I, I feel like with myself, like even even if it doesn't seem like it, like I'll try to tone things down on a certain person or certain certain groups or whatever for a little bit. And then I'll just see something and I'll be like, damn it. <laughs> like, it's just, and then it's just like back to square one. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I feel like, I feel like it's kind of, if any of that is ever going to get resolved. And I'm not saying like, I'm not responsible for that. Like I'm, I'm like on the front lines of this shit, <laughs> but it's going to take like people who really don't like each other, like coming together and actually having a conversation. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I feel like most of the problems that we have in this party come from it being too small. Like if we yeah. if we had a couple million people, uh, none of this personal drama would actually be affecting the party itself. Like it would be affecting all the people, and maybe like state parties would would be fractionalized over like a breakup or something like that. But you know, the fucking GOP is never gonna get crippled by a bad breakup. Or, right. or a friendship getting ruined yeah. or, you know, some mean words on the internet is never going to be able to break apart. And it's like either of the other two parties, it sh probably won't even do that to the greens. Cause they at least like, I don't know, they just don't seem to be like that. But for some reason we let that get to us. And the other big issue that people are fighting against right now, I think also gets solved by that. You know, the, the like takeover rhetoric and the the fear behind that it's like if we had a million members a takeover would be next to impossible you know right. if if we had thousands of people at the pa convention two weeks ago that 120 people that the mises caucus brought wouldn't have mattered it wouldn't have been anything and we could have let them vote and it just wouldn't have mattered it would have been a moot point uh, but we've been stuck way too long on gatekeeping and making sure that only the purest of libertarians are in the party that were still tiny and take overable. Yeah. It's, it's weird how like everyone, like the opposite of, of other parties, like everyone kind of knows each other. Like, mm -hmm. and like, I feel like you don't know, like 
inside drama about the uh, personal lives of like GOP delegates or something like that. But in the LP, like that's everywhere. Right. And why is that? Do you think? Why do you think we turned our politics into a soap opera? <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, social media is probably part of it, but I've heard there were these fights even before social media. I feel like the LP kind of has, it's, it's always had warring factions from what I've heard. Like even in like the eighties, there was like the, I don't know, the Cato faction versus like the Rothbard faction. So it's not even like mm -hmm. a social media invention, I guess, especially because yeah. libertarians are so anti-authoritarian and they don't want other people telling them what to do. And they really want their way. I feel like that's gotta be part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's amazing how authoritarian we are when it comes to our own party. <laughs> It's like we're we're literally the entire party exists because we think that no one entity could adequately message to or rule over or understand 350 million people. That's the entire like reason we exist. But yet we also exist to fight over one entity that's supposed to market and message and uh, understand 350 million people. No, that's the, the that's entire idea true. of LP national is a conundrum. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just mm -hmm. I'm just laughing at the comments. Yeah. I'm not sure if you're seeing this come in right now. <laughs> yeah. Hey James. <laughs> I how's it going? We've never met before, but how's it going? Uh <laughs> he's been on our podcast. It was, that was an interesting one. Mm. He told us about uh, the times he got erotic message erotic messages from Cher. Interesting. I'm not, I'm not making that up, but <laughs> I'll have to go back and watch that episode. Sometime. Uh, it, most of it was from inside of a Denny's. That's that's how I'll sell it. There we go. Uh, but yeah, I think the like I said, the entire idea of like LP National is a is a contradiction in my mind. Like, and the fact that we fight over it so hard, and so many people care so much about the LNC and who's on it and who's a delegate and all of that stuff like the lnc should have two functions support the state parties and run a presidential candidate every four years this is yeah, basically it. and it really is all they do uh but people want it to do more and want it to be more authoritarian and more overarching and more centralized and more everything that we hate i feel like they want a leader to look to kind of thing like they want to like install their guy there and have them be like the big, like the face of libertarianism. And they want it to exactly reflect their values. I feel like that's kind of what a lot of people are looking for. Yeah. For better or worse. Mm -hmm. And before anybody uh, thinks that we're talking about, or at least I'm talking about only one group of people, I mean every caucus and no, every yeah. faction here. No, I, because, I agree with you there. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, the, the, the prags are just as bad on this. And I am a prag. Uh, but it's the same thing in, in all the factions and all the caucuses. No, I don't, I don't disagree make sense to me. And I'm, I'm not in a caucus right now, but I mean, you can, no. you could say I'm definitely in a faction and I'm, I'm trying to be objective about it when we're talking about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, there's, it's, it's difficult to stay that way, especially when it starts getting personal. Uh, that's been my struggle lately is it was very easy when I was doing just the state stuff and, you know, actually had like all, all the people in the LP that I was talking to in 2019, except for like the couple of friends that I had online, like they were all in person friends. Like Brianna lived in the same city as I did. She worked on my campaign. Like we used to hang out fairly regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, all of the other people that I talked to in the movement were within the state of New York for the most part. And then I would see the national drama, but I was so removed from it and I had no personal attachment to anyone in it that it was just kind of like a soap opera that I could watch and, and care about a little bit and maybe vote on or influence. But so it was like, just like an interactive soap opera basically. And then I started making friends and I started like kind of moving up in the movement and my friends started moving up in the movement and then weird shit happened there because internet makes you hate p 
people that you actually love in real life. <laughs> I almost, I literally almost blocked Brianna for a time because of all of this. I think I remember and, you, you two fighting. Yeah, it was, it was months. It was months where like most of our conversations uh, in private were just uh, like fuller, more drawn out versions of the arguments that we were having online. It was always like, the 180 character limit was getting to us. So we moved to, to the DMs or to text and that was still most of our interaction and it was horrible. And, you know, similar things are happening now with other friends and it's just a very obnoxious scenario where your online persona actually becomes like more important and a bigger part of you than your actual personality is. No, I get that. Cause I, I I can remember like, like obviously like I'm pretty much nobody, but I, I'm like a D list cele celebritarian at best. But I remember like the days <laughs> when like no one had any idea who I was. Like I'd write something and post it somewhere and like, wouldn't, I maybe get a few comments or likes on it, but no one's like, mm -hmm. no one knows who I am. You know what I mean? It's, it's definitely way different once, once it really gets to the point where like someone, someone you don't even know knows who you are. Mm-hmm. It was funny. I sent the the like this week on promo to a couple of people that had uh, like your your name and Caitlin's, and I was like, "Oh, I'm totally getting canceled this week." And I had like three different people be like, "Who's that John guy?" <laughs> I'm like, "Oh, creator of Fakeritarians," and then they're like, "Oh shit, yeah, yeah you're getting canceled." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like at least I kind of have that saving me a little bit. Like, not everyone mm -hmm. knows my name, or people know the page's name, so I can blend in a little bit. That's probably why you uh, mm -hmm. didn't get too much shit this well, week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's okay. I didn't expect you to look like you do when <laughs> when I came on or when I started watching your show before I went on, just to kind of like get a good vibe. I was like, "Oh, interesting." I was just I don't know why the entire time that we've interacted online, I was just like picturing like some like mid 40s kind of chunky bearded <laughs> dude. And I'm just like, oh, all right. It's it's not. That's <laughs> mid 40s chunky bearded dude. Wow. I mean, that's, to be fair, you're an online libertarian. It's, it's that's a true. pretty, pretty good process of elimination that like that that's that that's who you are because it's 98 percent of us. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just wondering what kind of persona I'm giving off now. <laughs> uh, the angry white man, you know? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, but so, yeah, the, the, the drama has pervaded the actual, like, philosoph the philosophical conversations that we got, used to pride ourselves on. Like, I, I think the, the L, one of the LP's problems is that we've basically just been a book club for 50 years but at least we were mm. like a a pretty cool good book club with like really good books on the reading list and a lot of really well-read people that were you know talking about it and you know, i've watched like uh like videos of meetings and speeches and stuff from like the 80s and the 90s out of the lp and like harry brown's campaign yeah. and like uh and ron paul's first campaign and some of that stuff is just so much better than like anything I've seen from the LP in a while. And I then in general, I think we lost you. Should I start like reading Wikipedia pages or something? There we go. Oh, you're back. All right. 
I'm back. Yeah, I was I was about to start reading off the Titano Boa Wikipedia page. <laughs> I do that when we when we need to fill time on our podcast. It's like this like forty foot long extinct snake. I li- I legit had it pulled out. <laughs> <laughs> that's great i'm i'm kind of i'm kind of sad i was able to connect in time because that would be a great little little chunk of the show uh yeah no my internet just decided to completely just go out so always always a good time uh okay where were we um talking oh talking about why politics is better in the 80s and 90s uh i'm i'm curious if if most of that is just the fact that politics itself was better back then, um, you know, we weren't like 2016 did a number on us as, as a country and 08 wasn't great either. Like, no. uh, that was some of, that was the most divisive thing I had ever seen to date. Like when it was happening, like, in know, eight, like having a bunch getting called a racist because I, I was, wasn't even voting yet, but I got called a racist for being a, a, a Romney fan. And it was just like the weirdest just dichotomy of bullshit and like these forced binaries of like, if you don't like this person, you must like this person and just confused the shit out of me. I didn't understand any of it. And that's why I, I think that's I'm if those two elections, if like 08 and 12 weren't as shitty as they were, I don't know if I would have ended up being a libertarian. Well, it worked out then. I mean, there's that. <laughs> But then yeah. 2016 came along. That's, that's <laughs> blew those out of the water. I feel like. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm glad that I'm glad that Gary Johnson existed. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that there is a lot of shit going on, but it has to be creating more people like myself, like 2012 version of David. Of like, this is fucked up. I don't like this. Let's start looking for other options. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I hope so. But the thing that worries me, too, is that I feel like Trump kind of came out of that, too. And that's just been a total shit show. Like, people wanted something different. Like, mm-hmm. we got to, like, channel those people's energy, like, to a good place instead mm-hmm. of, like, build the wall, keep the Mexicans out kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you touched on the hero worship aspect of it earlier. Mm-hmm. And that's a huge, huge part of it. I have noticed it it's pervasive in every aspect of life though. It just yeah. now kind of started to, to bleed into politics, but I mean, people do that with their freaking quarterbacks and their sports teams and their pastors and their bosses and yeah. the, the manager at the Wendy's that they prefer to the other Wendy's across town. Like it, it's an all day, everyday thing where people just latch on to another flawed human as if they're not another flawed human. Right. Uh, I have noticed that, you know, on average, libertarians are usually a little bit better about that kind of stuff because we've kind of broken out from the, the like false binaries and the, the hero worship long enough to find the LP. But then we, a lot of people just snap right back to it, myself yeah. included. Like when I joined the LP, I was like, biggest gary johnson stand in the world and i've i've gone to war with people in the comments that criticized gary johnson for like the bake the cake thing or or his comments on weed i was i i've really like gone to town in defense of him on on issues that i did not agree with him on just because it was gary and he's the person that brought me to the party no, I've seen. I've definitely seen a lot of that it gets it gets in like in all corners of the liberty movement it gets really clicky Mm -hmm. like Obviously, like I think it happens in more in some than others, and I criticize that a lot. But it happens everywhere, honestly. Like mm-hmm. the the big hero worship thing. Yeah, yeah, and I, it's a that's just like a human thing. That's not even a party issue. That's yeah. just like a, no, a societal issue. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious how. Uh, I'm curious how to break that not just in the party, but also just in society. And I feel like libertarianism should be the answer to that question. But seeing like, you know, judging off of what we just said, it seems to not be. I'm curious what we can, what we can tell people. I mean, maybe accepting criticism of people you like, I think that's the best thing. I mean, obviously it has to be like criticism that actually makes sense Mm -hmm. and not just like random attacks but 
I feel like people have to be willing to concede that the people, even the people that brought them in or the people they support aren't perfect. Mm -hmm. And like, honestly, like even if, if people just looked to the people they like the most, like the figures they like the most in the party and kind of identified for themselves, some of the issues wrong with them. Cause I feel like if someone else does it, it gets very combative really quickly. Mm -hmm. But if, if you kind of do an evaluation at your evaluation on it yourself, that might be useful. That's a good, good piece of advice. Uh, that's something that again, goes outside of the party and out of politics. Like, just yeah, double check nature. yourself. Uh, if if there's somebody who you're emulating, even if it's just like a mentor or a friend, like it, that that double check is is very helpful. Uh, and it's it's interesting because a lot of those people that you know you said like you know I, if you identify the person that that you like the most, if you actually look at them, most of them will tell you that they're not perfect and that you shouldn't yeah. be worshiping them. I mean, Ron Paul's a great example. He said so many thousands of times, like don't glorify politicians. Don't worship me. I'm just a politician. Like he's said it so many times. And yet we still have millions of people that are just sucking his dick constantly. <laughs> like people whip if you, if you have a criticism about him. I was in a clubhouse room the other day where the the newsletters got brought up and it was actually a very like the person that brought it up did it in a pretty chill manner you know it was a very just objective like this is a criticism of ron that we need to be aware of and like how do we he was basically just asking like how do we combat this critique correctly uh and you know, without letting it ruin libertarianism, if somebody throws these out at, at us. And it was it was a productive conversation, or it was supposed to be. And like three other people in the room were just like, ah, oh, why are we shitting on Ron Paul? We should be blah, blah, blah. And it's like, we weren't shitting on Ron Paul. We were like uh, identifying an objective fact that a thing happened that people know about. And how do we go forward from here? It's not a critique. It's a fact. Yeah. Like... No, like I supported him in 2012, but like the newsletters were pretty shitty. Like I really wish they didn't happen. They're mm -hmm. not going to like things like that aren't going to help bring people into the party or people into the movement. Yeah. I will say it is interesting that it's such a big part of the conversation now, knowing how many people still join the movement regardless of them or didn't know about them when it happened. I mean, I didn't, I didn't learn about them until last year. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, and I know plenty of people that still don't know what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, I still haven't read very much of it. I've seen like the bits and pieces people have sent me, but I'm not going to go out there and spend my time reading something that some anonymous person wrote that I like, I don't have time for that shit. I'm an anonymous person who doesn't like Mighty Ducks too. Sorry, yeah. but um, <laughs> but no, I remember it. I remember it popping up in uh, mm -hmm. in during the 2012 election cycle. Like it was it, a little bit in 2008, and then, like I said, I wasn't a Ron Paul fan in 2008. But in in 2012, like it was getting a lot of press, and mm. like you could say, like yeah, a lot of people have joined the party despite that, or joined the movement or party despite that, and that. Um, like, okay, they're here, but we might have had more people who have gotten turned off. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not, I, I would say some people, like, if they actually read the contents of it, there's going to be some people okay with it. I'm not personally okay with it myself. I feel like there's going to be more people that look at that and are like, what the hell is this? Because there's some, mm -hmm. there's some pretty shitty stuff in there. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of back to the to the earlier conversation of like how imperfect some of our best messengers have been uh i don't mean to like kind of challenge your entire thesis of your existence but for me <laughs> i i i find it very interesting that we've that we're still so much of like perfectionists and again this is this is me too uh i mean i've railed against LP New Hampshire a little bit the last couple of days and like plenty of other people in the movement. And on the other side of things, I've condemned people that are too milk toast and too wishy-washy. And it's like the, the perfectionism is kind of confusing myself right now. Like as I'm, 
I'm in where I'm at now. It's looking back on how obnoxious I used to be. It's, it's interesting that, you know, we've, we've seen so many terrible messengers do so much good work. And then we still, uh, try to be perfectionists about it. So my argument there would be that self-policing our movement would be better than letting our ideological enemies use our flaws against us. So if we can kind of clean things up on our own, they won't mm -hmm. be able to get taken advantage of by people who are against us. It's pretty short and succinct, but I think it gets the point across. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I 100% I agree. We need to be self-policing. Um, I'm just curious, or I, I'm not sure for myself where that line is now. Yeah, because I've I've started to just ignore a lot of it, and you know, it, there's too many accounts uh, online that have the word libertarian in their bio saying dumb shit. Oh, yeah. That it's just like you were never gonna actually be. I don't know if I don't know if the libertarian name is salvageable anymore. I guess is kind of where I'm at. It's like I think to a point the damage has been done both by the people saying the dumb shit and then by uh, the other people making it the most like shared tweet that they will ever have uh over and over and over again. It's like, I mean, with the with the LP Kentucky shit, like they had a thousand, they had like 1,200 followers when they sent that gold star tweet. And now they're oh, like 7,000 and one of the most popular libertarian accounts on the internet right now because a bunch of morons decided to share it. <laughs> yeah, it's tough because you want you want to call it out, but there is that effect. And I've I've seen it before. It happened in, yes. uh, in 2018 when Matt Kino was running for chair and he'd say a bunch of, weird stuff and i feel like he kind of gained a following for that that was when he was starting to kind of go tanky near the end of that mm -hmm. and he uh like he was saying like stuff about landlords getting the wall i remember i remember that was a yeah <laughs> but yeah I do, I do worry sometimes about amplifying things but then there's part of me that's like i would rather someone actually call this out and other people see that there are libertarians calling this out instead of thinking that all libertarians agree with this. So it's it's a tough balance. Yeah, I as long as our persona and you know what we're known for is the fact that you know we're radical individualists and so that causes us to to police ourselves and to be extremely decentralized and to have a lot of disagreements that we settle in the public square and that's what we're known for. And that's kind of our reputation. So when people join and they see the infighting, they're not like taken aback by it. They're actually like, oh, this is the infighting they told me about. This is neat because it really is one of the things that makes us better than the other two parties. The fact that we do police ourselves, that we do actually have these conversations and we'll actually challenge each other and call people out that are being bad actors is one of the main differences between us and the duopoly. So if we were using that as a selling point, then I think maybe we can like ease people into it. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like everyone knows about the libertarian infighting. It's just like a, a thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. right yeah. At this that. point, at this point, it really is what we're known for. And a lot of people that I've talked to that are brand new to the party have told me that that's one of the main reasons they haven't joined yet. It was, you know, they took a gander at some Twitter accounts and saw the dumpster fire that it was and just walked the fuck away, you know, joined a pack or an organization, you know, they've been a part of normal for the last decade or something yeah. instead of the LP because we're a shit show. And, and they get some, they actually might get something done. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. They, normals, normal has done a lot more than the LP yeah. has. That's for sure. Sadly. No, so I mean I like what they do too. Don't get me wrong, but oh yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, I just wish that like every person that was a member or activist and in, in normal was also a big L libertarian that voted libertarian and that took part just in a cursory level in the partisan politics and like was a libertarian instead of having all of these organizations out here for independence. And and we're just kind of SOL sitting in the middle, like, oh yeah, we were we we've been talking about that for years while other groups are going and actually making it a reality. 
Yeah. <laughs> Can't disagree with you there. Mm -hmm. So I got one more question for you. Um, yeah. What is your favorite movie and why is it Mighty Ducks 2? <laughs> well, the because they have... Uh... God, what did he say? Because there's a girl that skates and because there's minority skating and because what was it like the black kids from LA teach people teach them how to play hockey and apparently mm -hmm. that's like that's anti-white or something so yeah that's that's why my favorite it's my favorite movie <laughs> I that cracked me the fuck up I've reread that a couple of times now <laughs> just because it's too hilarious if you guys don't know what we're talking about, this is a direct assault on Lou Rockwell and his <laughs> Mighty Ducks 2 review. I don't know. I'm non confrontational on the show, except for like Pete Quiznos and, and Lou Rockwell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I remember. So we were doing a we were doing a Lou Rockwell Christmas special for our Faker Terrians podcast. Mm -hmm. Like I had an intro made up with like snow and everything. <laughs> but I was it was even like the day of the podcast. I was just reading through some of the old uh Rothbard Rockwell reports. Mm -hmm. And I, I just see like, why is the ice still white? And I'm like, huh, what's, what's this article? And I just start reading it. And I'm like, wait, what? Cause I had never seen that before. I don't think, I don't think it was like a thing before we dug it up. I feel like it was just kind of lost to history. That's awesome. That's a great find. <laughs> so I gotta say that's like, that's probably like, I think there's more important things we've called out, but that's still my favorite thing we've ever done. <laughs> It's the most blatant thing because when, like, I don't have a that big of a problem with people that have those ideas in their head, right? Like, I I have too many friends, too many family members that could have written that article to like write off people that think those things. Mm -hmm. However, to publish it in your own publication to like go through the work of having your own publication and then writing this all out and then actually publishing it to the world is like a step above and beyond that makes you no longer just like a closeted racist. Like yeah. you are actively out here doing this shit, going through the work that it takes to let people know that you're a racist. Like putting your name on that and sending mm -hmm. it out. I actually, uh, I emailed him a few weeks ago and I tried to, I told him I enjoyed his review of the mighty ducks too. And I asked for his new, his thoughts on the new TV series and he never got back to me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was talking to my dad about that and he assumed that it was a review of the movie series and that it was like new, uh, like a new thing. Yeah. But, but I was like, Nope, Nope. This is like a, this article is as old as I am. I was like two when he wrote that article. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> something like that or three i think the movie came out in like 99 uh it's yeah sometime it's been in the a 90s. while mm -hmm. uh and to me the 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 age of that article is important because a lot of people di like discount it because it's that old but for me if that article was written now i would almost understand it more like the like rage against the woke and like the minorities yeah. being shoved down our throat kind of logic is actually kind of founded in truth a little bit now like there is a lot of that and it is everywhere and it like media is being obnoxious about some things and i can understand the people that that are in that mindset now but in the 90s it was like 98 percent of all people in all movies were white as fuck it's I like the, there was this one movie where some black kids played a sport that you didn't think <laughs> black kids are supposed to play and it's like ah uh, uh, what this doesn't even compute. No, I'm I'm with you there. Mm -hmm. I did like that uh, that Christmas intro though. You, you <laughs> posted, posted that I on Twitter lot, the other day. I had a lot of fun putting that one together. <laughs> That's like one of my favorite things. Like I'll spend like a few hours making the intro, and then I'll like do like 15 minutes of podcast prep. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate to that one pretty hard. Uh, I had like zero questions going into last night. I was thinking of all of them on the fly because I had spent all of the weekend and most of this week just making the intro. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely get that. Yeah. Uh, fly, on the fly questions are more fun though. Yeah, no, they are. It's like, it's less forced, you know, this comment just, is pretty random, but I'm going to throw it up there just cause yeah, that's our, that's our co-host. Mm -hmm. 
Because uh, that at the end of the, uh, I think it's at the end of the Lou Rockwell intro. I say fuck Tucker Carlson. Mm. I think that's what it's from. That that would make sense. <laughs> All right. So before we wrap up, uh, tell people how to how to find you and Fakertarians and maybe get involved and help police the police. <laughs> so I actually I always forget to like plug stuff. So I actually like, I wrote it down on this piece of paper, like the links we have mm -hmm. no joke, but uh, we have some articles at fakertarians.com, but it looks like a website that was made in like 2002. It's still better than like Lou Rockwell.com, which makes looks like it was made in like 1998. But uh, and then there's twitter.com slash fakertarians. There's facebook.com slash fakertarians. Uh, we have our podcasts on all the podcast app, uh, youtube.com. Uh, I think it's slash C slash Fakertarians and we're on like Twitch and Reddit or something too, but I don't even know. But yeah, you can, <laughs> you can find us there. We're around. All right. Are you, uh, are you actively recruiting more people to the, to the Fakertarian army? I mean, yeah, we're always looking for people. I feel like we've had some turnover over the years. I'm mm -hmm. trying to think like we have like, in terms of original admins, I think it's just, no, maybe there's, Maybe there's three, but some of them aren't that active, but they're still there. But we have like, we, we have a lot more admins than people know about too. Like we have like mm -hmm. some people who just kind of keep that on the down low. I've, yeah, I've met a couple of them <laughs> lately that I didn't realize yeah. were associated with you in any way, shape or form. Cause you get, a, you get a lot of shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we had one of our admins got, I think someone threatened to send like the mafia after him like six months ago, the guy was, the guy was just like insane, but that, that was a real thing. It's, it's probably still up in our discussion group. He's like, I know some people and you better not be talking to me like that. But yeah. That's us. <laughs> I love how obnoxious people get about like internet feuds. Oh yeah. I can't even tell you how many times people have threatened to sue us too. Mm. Like so many, I can probably think of like 10 different people who have threatened to sue us. Are you worried about that at all? Do you think no, you've crossed the line? I know I haven't because I work in the criminal defense in industry and I'm uh, I'm planning on being an attorney. So I actually, I actually know I haven't crossed the line, at least to a fair degree. That's good. Uh, yeah, because yeah, I don't know where that line is between saying mean things and actual slander. Yeah. Well, everyone like... I feel like people just like to misinterpret laws all the time. Like everything's a HIPAA violation or everything's like slander. Oh my God. The HIPAA violations <laughs> piss me off. So we, we made a new, we made a new, Oh, keep going. No, no. I was just gonna say, I used to, I used to work in uh, like insurance and shit like that. And so I actually had to, I had to be compliant, but to a different law. And so I learned the difference between HIPAA and like the other stuff right. that, does similar things and how little HIPAA really actually covers. And so listening to people say that word just. So we made a, a rule in Fakertarian's discussion group uh, that you can't violate HIPAA. And when, when people just say like a bunch of dumb shitty stuff, we just, we mute them and say they violated HIPAA. That's the thing we've been having fun with lately. I like that. <laughs> you can't violate HIPAA. No. Just hippo or with the, with the two P's or yeah. <laughs> I actually, there was a, speaking of tying this back, I was on lourockwell.com today, sadly, but uh, there was an article and someone spelled HIPAA H I P P A. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I will never cease to be amazed by the amount of dumb fuckery people are willing to put on their own timelines and again including myself yeah like oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you can find some dumb shit on faker darians too oh yeah uh yeah i it's it's a weird like uh impulse that we have to like share the thoughts that we have and the things that we do it's like uh, the reason that our parents are able to like go have careers and be presentable adults is because none of this evidence exists of them from when they were teenagers <laughs> No, that, that's going to be so weird. Like, I don't know, like 20, 30 years from now when you're like looking back at like the president's tweets from when they were like 13. Mm -hmm. Maybe on Wayback Machine or something. 
Oh yeah. I feel worried about that for like the next generation. Cause at least, you know, I was, I was probably like t- between 10 and 15 when cell phones st- started to really be a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like the idea of like everyone having their phones out and like recording everything that was going on wasn't until I was in like senior high, almost graduated. But now like my nephew, he's almost six and there are hundreds of hours of video of him doing dumb shit. And it's like, I'm going to have a lot of fun showing that stuff to his <laughs> wife someday. Like it's going to be a really good day of just yeah. like scrolling back through all of this. Like, Oh, look at when Alex was uh, like legitimately believed that dinosaurs were chasing him. <laughs> It'll be interesting. Yeah, that'll be fun. Well, John, thanks so much for coming on. This was great. Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, fun. Yeah. I uh, Thanks for having me on your show, too. That was a good time. Yeah, that was good, too. I hope we didn't like get you excommunicated from too many circles, either with yeah. this or with coming on our show. But... Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll build those bridges back if they got burned. Yeah. There you go. If, if they're worth it. <laughs> all right guys thank you so much for watching we will catch you back here next tuesday with uh natalie bruno at 9 p.m eastern standard time until then keep up the fight hey fighters thanks for watching don't forget to follow subscribe and support the fight by going to linktree slash fight for liberty